underway, and I'm sure you'll extend every courtesy to our speakers. For those of you who don't know me, I'm Rich Gerard, and it's been an honor for me over the past several years <laughs> to uh, thank you very much. I, I, I like to send them whatever they want on my tab. But uh, it's been my honor to uh, be the master of ceremonies here. I've been studying up. Uh, to Mr. Uh, Barnum and Bailey to figure out how to run this three-ring circus. But among the things I get to do as your master of ceremonies is introduce the speakers that we have today. And to get us started is a fellow I've had the opportunity to interview on my radio show and uh, get to know a little bit. He'll be back, no doubt, over and over again. His name is Eddie Edwards, and he's seeking the Republican nomination for Congress in the 1st Congressional District here in the state of New Hampshire. And I am uh, happy to bring him to the microphone to spend uh, the next few minutes talking to you. And uh, since he's relatively new here, we've already, uh, we've already explained that uh, this is a lot like herding geese and herding cats. Herding geese, herding cats, how about chickens too? Uh, but we know you're listening and we know deep down you want to hear what he has to say, so give it up for Eddie Edwards. Thank you, Rich. And uh, thank all of you for being here tonight. Today, I'm just trying to test you guys out, make sure you're listening. Uh, Thank you. Again, my name is Eddie Edwards. I'm running for Congress in the 1st Congressional District. I want to thank Ed, Ed Nell, who's here. Can you guys hear me? Okay. I want to thank Ed Nell uh, for inviting me here today. It's such a pleasure to speak to you. This is my first time speaking with you. I'd like to share you a little bit about my background with you and why I'm running. First of all, I, uh, I'm a Navy veteran. I'm very proud of my service to my country. I'm also a retired police chief. Uh, and I'm very proud of that service. So, when people ask me why I'm running, I tell you I'm running for the same reason I saw, became a Navy veteran. For the same reason I became a police chief. Because I care about this country. I love this country. And in Congressional District 1, as you know, this seat has flip-flopped for the last 16 years or so. We've gone from a Republican to a Democrat to a Republican to a Democrat. And that has to stop. And to do that, it's going to take a conservative candidate, an honest conservative candidate. Now, I came out, I've come out early for one reason. I want you to know me. I want you to get to know me. So that you're not shocked and not disappointed. And you have to understand what I believe in and what I stand for. Now, that, that only happens when you get to know the candidate. Now, in Carroll Shape Water, we have someone who's representing a Republican district. We have a Democrat in a Republican district who represents us. Now, I'm sure we can all agree, we're all challenged by how the fact that Carroll Shape Water gets elected. I'm challenged by that. I think the Democratic Party is challenged by that. And no one is more challenged by that than Carroll Shape Water herself. This woman is completely shocked that she wins in Congressional District 1, ever. But she doesn't. So, we have to win in 18, and we have to hold our seat in 20. And how do we get there? We get there by being honest. We get there by looking at things that matters to Americans, to folks in New Hampshire, to folks in Congressional District 1. And what is that? That's character. One of the things that we lack in politics is character. One of the things that we don't focus on anymore is character. We talk about issues, and I'm happy to talk about issues all day long with anyone who wants to talk about those things. But the one thing we're missing is character. Just like in the United States Navy when I was there, you live by a code. When I was in police work, you live by a code, a code of expectations. And I'm not suggesting that every single person in the United States military or in law enforcement is an angel. But what I am suggesting is that you live by a code. And that's an expectation. When you don't live up to that code. There's a consequence when you don't live up to that code. And here, we don't have that anymore. We don't listen. We don't focus. We don't understand the character of the person who's running for office. And that's important. That's important to, to establish. So what are the real issues that people care about? Tax reform. You're here because you care about tax reform. All right, so how do you reduce your taxes while at the same time you allow government to expand as well? 
Exactly. We have to keep the role of government reduced. But when, when's the last time you heard of any federal organization being successfully reduced in size and scope? You've never heard of it. So that's one of the things we're talking about. We're talking about your constitutional rights, the Bill of Rights. There are 10 Bill of Rights, and you, and you guys get them, and you understand them very well. But are they protected every single day by your elected officials? No, they're not. They're not. And when you look at when you look at the executive branch of government, this is where your roadblock is. This is where your problems lie. In the executive branch of government, when you seek a permit, when you seek a license, when laws and rules are being enforced against you, those are coming from the executive branch of government, not the legislative branch of government. So how do we examine the people who have been put in office? How do we do that? We look at the character of the people we elected. And right now, there is no metrics for examining the character of a person who you elect. What do we look at? We look at how much money you raise. We look at your likability. We look at how long you've been in office. Now, I'm telling you, I'm a wonderful person, but I don't deserve to be in Congress or in politics for 20 or 30 years. No one does. So if you, if you have somebody who you have elected and you've seen them in Congress for 20 to 30 years, that's a shame. And that's up to us. We, we live in a country with 330 million people. Are you telling me that that same person has to go back to Congress, to Washington, year after year? That has to stop. Right now, back in the 1970s, 70% of people in Congress had a prior military background. We're conducting this picnic, this meeting, in the American Legion post here. 70% of people in Congress in the 1970s had a military background. Today, it's 18%. 18% of Congress has a military background. Beyond that, this is the first time, I want all of you to understand this because this is very important. This is the first time in 76 years in this country, 76 years, that we do not have a wartime uh, U.S. Supreme Court justice that has wartime military experience. 76 years in the, uh, in the US, United States Supreme Court we do not have a justice that has wartime military experience. That's a shame. It's time that we put ethics back into politics. It's time that we really enforce term limits. It's time that we not just look at the Fed, but we understand that how do we remove people from office? How do you remove someone from office? Someone who's appointed on the Fed, the governor's uh, board of governors, a 14-year term. 14-year term, and you can't remove them. How is that possible in the United States of America that you have anyone appointed to a job and you, they cannot be removed for 14 years? I'll give you my own experience about my job here. As, you, as some of you may know or may not know, I used to be the chief of liquor enforcement in the state of New Hampshire. That job, that position was created in the 1930s. And so from 1930s to about 2010, that job was protected by the union. In 2010, myself and some other folks, we decided that that position should not be protected by a union. It should not be protected by a union. So I took my own job in state government and turned it into one as an ad will employee. I didn't have to do that. I did that because it's the right thing to do. And you will know people by what they've done. The best way to tell the future, predict the future of a person, is their past performance. So when people stand before you and they tell you they want to represent you, they want to, they want to be your representative, it's important for you to understand what they stand for, what they stood for in their past, what they've done in their past. That's the best way to examine what they're going to do in the future. And the only way to know that, and I keep going back to this because it's important, it's time we look at the character of the people we elect. If you don't examine the character of the people you elect, you have missed an opportunity to reshape our country. If you and I agree on every single issue, from tax to gun rights to changing to eliminating the power of the, the executive branch, but we agree on all of those things, but you know that you're electing someone who's a liar or manipulator, shame on you. Never vote 
Never get your vote or your support to someone you don't know. I've announced it April 5th of this year, so I want every, each and every one of you to get to know me. Because in the end, I'm going to be your nominee, I'm going to be your candidate who's going to represent you in congressional disarray against Carol J. Porter. We're going to beat her. We're going to beat back the Democrats. We're going to hold this seat. Um, and we will hold this seat. And I will not be a, someone seeking to build a political career in Washington. I'm going to do my job. I'm going to be your voice in Washington, and I'm coming back home. And I'm going to say to you, it's your turn to go to Washington. Everyone deserves a turn in the crazy house. Everyone. So thank you for being here. Please, please, if you do anything, go to my website. Check me out, look at my issues, look at my positions, question me. My cell phone is on the back of the materials you have today. I encourage any of you, if you have a problem, you have a concern, to call me. I'm happy to answer any of your questions. I need your support. I need your support early. Don't wait. Don't wait till the end and say, well, wait. I'm going to wait till after the primary. But I assume you're going to support the, the, the Republican candidate after the primary. I need your support before the primary. That's when it matters. Thank you. All right, everybody. What time we have? Okay. Is uh, Ed Nail in the house? Yeah, is he here? He's not. State Representative John Burt. Some, if, if you want some fun, uh, some fun radio, just tune in on the days where John Burt's sitting in as a co-host or a guest host on, on the radio show. He brings folksy to a whole new level. But uh, without further ado, we're pleased to have uh, State Representative John Burt, who hails from Goffstown and represents Ware and Deering, also in the State House, uh, for the next few minutes. Representative John Burt. Thank you, Rick. Can everybody hear me? Yeah. <laughs> All right, I want to make sure, is Kim here? Kimberly? Yeah. She's right here. In case I offend anybody in here, I want Kimberly to make sure that the safe space area is set and ready to go. Because for some reason, I have done that in the past, I don't know why. But there are sensitive people among us. Now the other thing I was wondering is, who here really believes that CNN sucks? That's right. The problem is, is we have, well, I can't say WM and blah, blah down the road. They're just as bad. The rest of them, I mean, it's sad. Just look at the media that we have that fights against the conservative agenda. And look what happens. President Trump goes overseas, and he's greeted pretty happily in most areas that he shows up in. Poland, they treat him good. They're all happy with him. And the reason is, is that hopefully we're going to start pushing the conservative agenda down there, which, you know, sometimes I wonder if it's worth even, you know, bothering with D.C., maybe if we just get rid of them all together and just go back to states' rights, I think, is the best thing to do. Now, on Tuesday, I am going to Alaska. It is going to be cool up there. Now, the problem is I have to go to Mass to fly out of, out of Boston, and I am carrying an Alaska. So I'm a little nervous, but all my friends that do it every day, they said, John, it's not a problem. But I've never gone to Mass that I'm willing to admit with my gun. <laughs> so, you know, of course, I'll have it in my lockbox and everything else and try to comply with uh, their silly little rules down there. But what we need to do is to make sure that we get constitutional carry through the whole country. Yeah. That is what we need. We have worked extremely hard in New Hampshire. I personally have sponsored or co-sponsored constitutional carry in New Hampshire many times. For some reason, I wasn't on it this year, 
and it passes. So hopefully that doesn't mean something against me, but I was pretty happy to stand next to the governor when he signed that in. And I think the governor uh, was a little surprised when I, you know, I'll tell you, my emotions got the best of me during the sign-in, because bottom line, one of the main reasons I went up there, I'm from Vermont, the land of the free with a gun, because Vermont left me in the 90s, so that's when I moved to New Hampshire, because they went so far to the left. Luckily over there, it's in the Constitution that it's so hard that they're not going to ever get gun control over there. But I'm very dear to me to have this. So when the governor signed it, he stood up, shook a bunch of hands, and I gave him a big bear hug. And, you know, I thought that was pretty funny. Now, one thing that I want to make sure everybody understands is that we do have a U.S. Congress race coming up. I have thrown my name out there that I may look at it and may run. I'm still on the fence. I am looking at other options. And I want to have you guys help me with that decision. The other options are to stay in the House and possibly run for Speaker of the House. And then the last option is to stay in New Hampshire and not go to D.C. and run against Lou D'Alessandro. Now, according to the town worker guys, somehow I win my race, you know, pretty overwhelmingly. Last time I beat the, the poor guy that ran against me, 1,807 votes. And they say that's a lot in a small district. But it's going to be extremely hard to pop Lou out. But I think I could do, you know, grab the votes. But I'm going to need help. So I need help on making this decision because I want to make it a month ago. Because as time goes by. Now for speaker, you know, personally, I like the current speaker. Personally. It's policy that I don't like. We're not sticking to the policies that is set in stone in the platform. Some of his chairs are good, but others, they should be Democrats. And that is where some of our problems lie. Is because once something passes out of one of those bad committees, the other leadership is forced to, to vote for this crap. And that is the conflict that we have. So that's one of the reasons I was thinking of running for speaker. And David Bates is also thinking about it. I don't want to throw his name out there, but I hope he does because we need more than just me running to send a message that we need to go back to the conservative values. So I hope you guys can help me with this to come up with the uh, conclusion of you know, where should I be in my future. And, you know, I want to thank everybody for being here today. And remember, the U.S. Congress race, we have to work hard to get rid of Shea Porter. Oh, my God. What a disaster she is. And the sad thing is, we have Hassan and um, whoever the other one is married to the lawyer. You know, Shaheen. You know, they're all just disasters down there because... You know, they won't even look at what is good for America. All they're looking at is party. They're going to vote whatever Hillary and Obama and that crowd tells them to vote. So I want to thank you for your time, and God bless America, and thank you, everybody. Let's get it up for Representative John Burt. Absolutely one of the good guys under the Golden Dome in Packet. All right, I think uh, we're going to, uh, Hal, are you ready? All right, so as uh, folks may or may not know, I'm going to take a second here while Hal gets himself uh, uh, set here. As you folks may or may not know, there is actually a debate raging across the country as to whether or not we should hold something called an Article 5 Convention of the States. And... Uh, 
there are varying opinions on whether or not we should fool with a constitutional convention. And uh, in the interest of making sure that everybody has the opportunity for all points of view to be known, there is a table right back, uh, right behind the 603 Alliance gentleman standing up there with his two hands in the air. I think I've interviewed him. They are, they are of the contrary opinion of our next speaker, who is the keynote of the, uh, of the event today. His name is Hal Shirtliff. He is the executive director of something called Camp Constitution. And for those of you with kids or grandkids, hey, listen up for just a second. Each and every year, out in Ringe, New Hampshire, Camp Constitution teaches kids about the history and heritage of our country and its founding. My kids have been going the last three years, and aside from a first-class education in the Constitution, it's also a first-class summer camp uh, uh, experience for the kids. But Hal is the executive director of Camp Constitution, and for reasons you're about to discover, is virulently opposed to an Article 5 constitutional convention, which many believe could lead to the complete undoing of the Constitution as it exists now. <sighs> well, it's a tough crowd, that's right. But uh, <laughs> that's always the thing, but that's, that's, that, that's why this is a great big family outing here at the Coalition of Hampshire Taxpayers. Without further ado, I give you uh, Hal Shortliff of Camp Constitution and his presentation against an Article 5 Convention of the States. All right, thank you very much. I uh, actually, our camp, our uh, last full day is today, so when this, uh, when I speak, I'm going to have to put, get a quick bite and head on out. Uh, I'd love to spend more time, but uh, camp, as I say, today's the last full day of camp, and I get to be there. I want to introduce uh, two friends of mine, actually three. Uh, Reverend Stevie Kraft, can you just come up and kind of acknowledge yourself? Reverend Kraft's been involved with our camp since 2010, a national treasure, my brother from another mother. We work together, we, we travel throughout the region on a yearly basis, and I tell you, his booming voice, which, uh, you don't need a PA. So just, uh, Rev, just say hello to the folks here. Hello, y'all. Yeah, I'm his brother from another mother. But guess what? We share the same value system, and that is Jesus is Lord and we're not. And the bottom line is simply this, brothers and sisters. If we do not get on our face before God and ask God to help us to save and restore our constitutional republic, we will lose it because we are fighting a spiritual war. And in order to win in a spiritual war, you have to use spiritual weapons. So what I want to say to every one of us, as far as our camp, Camp Constitution is concerned, next year, you have young people, because it's not only for young people, it's for, it's for families, it's for everybody who loves our nation. It's for all of those who see that we're losing our nation, but yet want to take an active role in restoring our constitutional republic. Camp Constitution is for you. So get with Mr. Shirtliff. Get the material for next year's camp, and we're hoping to see you there. God bless you. And also, who's booming, his voice isn't as booming as Dr. Punamatula Kashore. Dr. Kashore is, in my opinion, the top drug addiction specialist in the world, and Big Corporation offered him $60 million in 2010. Big Farmer, he said no. That's not what God put me on earth to do. He put me on earth to heal. In 2011, with the help of Martha Copley, they put him in jail, destroyed his clinics. A documentary about his ordeal is about to be released in October, and we play a part in that, uh, Camp Constitution. So I just want Doc to introduce himself very quickly. Thank you all for having me here. You know, we've got a major crisis on our hands, we need to remember it. And we 
we all have to gather together and fight. Uh, it's for the future of the country and future of our children. This is what we've been working on at the Camp Constitution. It's a great place, young people, wholesome uh, family staff. And we've been all thinking about how best to uh, launch ahead with, with uh, the counter-offensive from the grassroots. We have to get the grassroots working. And that's what we're here for. And I thank Hal for the opportunity. All right, thank you very much. <coughs> We, I, do, I do have a few things on the table. One of them is a little pamphlet about our camp, uh, this year's camp, with the references to our website. Also, our Bl Sam Blumenfeld archive. Some of you knew who Sam Blumenfeld was, a pioneer in the homeschool movement. We archived his works. We're getting about 240,000 views a month, as well as many downloads. It's an incredible resource for homeschoolers, researchers, historians, and something called Granite State Future. This was a pamphlet that we put together to help expose Agenda 21 in New Hampshire. I get a few of those left. So, before I go into my abbreviated presentation, I want to point out that there are a lot of people on both sides of the spectrum, historically, left and right, for different reasons. Also, one of the sponsors of the resolution that was introduced in New Hampshire for an Article 5 convention, Dan Itza, is a friend of mine. He's an honorable man, so just because you were on the different side doesn't mean we're enemies. I just wish he would reconsider his position. So, Article 5, I was going to read the whole thing, but I think we all know what it is. There's two ways the founders gave to amend the Constitution. And we're very glad they made it very difficult, on purpose. They made it difficult. You guys, it was way too loud out here. We got to turn down. Oh, okay, they made it difficult on purpose and for good reason. There's been over a thousand amendments introduced over the years. We've only had 27, and two of those, one nullified the other or canceled the other one out. So. The two ways to amend the Constitution, two-thirds of the House and Senate in Congress introduce the amendment, then it goes to the states, where Congress either has the mode of ratification will be state houses or state ratifying conventions. That's one of the facts that sometimes gets overlooked. And it was done when the 21st Amendment was, uh, was uh, approved. Uh, so, anyway, it's an interesting history. Before the ink was dry on the U.S. Constitution, uh, there were two Article 5 resolutions introduced. One of them was in Virginia, one of them was in New York. Uh, we've had, I think, over 600 over the years, or maybe more than that. From about 1890 to 1915, there was uh, this, the so-called progressives, I call them retrogressives, were pushing uh, these, uh, an income tax, but also the direct election of senators, which was a big mistake when states gave an important part of their, their power to, to the feds, actually. So there was a lot of resolutions introduced, and I think there was, we were about too shy at that point, and it was a way that Congress just said, okay, they didn't want to have an Article 5 convention, they figured the states would never go for this. They, they passed the amendment, it went to the states, and we're suffering under it again on this idea that our senators do no longer answer to the states, the state legislators, I should say. Uh, uh, then there's been all kinds of resolutions. There's been resolutions, for, a lot of them what I agree with, you know, for the amendment, like a pro-life amendment, uh, resolutions to repeal the 16th. There have been resolutions to have a world government, to have an Article 5 convention to propose means to have a world government. Um, 1987 to 19, uh, from, the, from the early 70s to the 80s, there was a drive to have what they call a balanced budget amendment, which I'll address in a few minutes. And at that point, we were about two states away, then a number of states started receiving their, their applications for it. And by 2010, we were down to about 20, maybe 22 states, maybe a little bit less, it's hard, sometimes hard to figure. 2011 was sort of a, where this most recent drive for an Article 5 convention got underway. There was a convention, it was called Conference on the Constitutional Convention, it was co-chaired by Larry Lessig of Harvard, a Harvard lawyer, a former Clinton advisor, a man decisively to the left. He's well known here in Maine, I mean here in uh, New Hampshire. Uh, he's, got a, he's got a political action committee called May Day PAC. Uh, a pack to end all PACs, he says, right. And the state will wither away. And Mr. Mark Meckler, who went on to later to form the Convention of States. I tried to get credentialed uh, as far as a panelist, but I ended up as a, I was definitely there as a media rep for the New American Magazine at the time. And in the wake of that, 
Convention of States was formed and Wolfpack was formed. Those are the two groups that are most active in New Hampshire, and of course, my friend there, Ken, over there with the Convention of States. Um, uh, uh, anyway, so uh, by, two, by 2015, there were a lot of states that introduced resolutions. I think the um, Wolfpack only managed five, and they have, you know, they're pretty well funded. Uh, and also, Convention of States, I think the count is up to 12, again, right? 12, and I know New Hampshire just recently tabled the most recent Convention of States resolution and the Wolfpack resolution. So let me just go into some of the arguments used by pro Article 5 supporters. And I, again, I agree with a lot they have to say. We have an out of control federal government. Well, to a large extent, that's true. But we have under control state governments that have been willing accomplices in this for over 100 years. So in other words, we can, if we're going to expect Congress to get it right, we better get our states right as well. Um, our big money needs to be out of politics. Well, what is big money? Um, big money could be a, a corporation that people support. In fact, uh, what was that? Citizens United, 2010. Well, they were a pack that was uh, exposing Hillary Clinton's uh, history. Well, what's so bad about that? But when you look at a corporation, a corporation can be a small church of 10 people or an individual. So that's really a, a real erosion of the First Amendment. That's being mainly promoted by Wolfpack, not Convention of States. Article 5 Convention cannot be a runaway. Well, if you read Article, of course, what do you def how do you define a runaway? Because I put that in quotation marks. If you read Article 5, it says the purpose is to propose amendments, plural. There's no wording in Article 5 that says you will propose a convention for a single issue or a particular topic. And whatever comes out of the state legislators, the delegates are not bound by it. And right now, there are absolutely no laws guiding an Article 5 convention whatsoever. Okay? Um, Three-fourths of the states needed uh, to pass any proposed amendments which would effectively stop any unreasonable amendments from being passed. Well, we passed two unreasonable ones, didn't we? A hundred years ago, the 16th and 17th, like, some of you may not agree, but I think most would, that they were unreasonable. And states do unreasonable things all of the time without an amendment being passed. I live in Massachusetts, I can attest to that. Uh, the media would report on the event. You know, the original one we had under the Articles of Confederation was held in secret. Do you really trust the media to give you a, a fair perspective on it? I think it, would be a, it may be a media circus. Now we're told that it is a remedy, the Article 5, that the founders predicted that something like this may happen, and that was a remedy to rein in an out-of-control government. There's nothing in the documents that I've read in the uh, in Madison's reports that say that. They said the purpose was to, to correct errors, and they did expect errors. They didn't think it was a perfect document. Um, they said that it was a gift, that the I say the whole Constitution was a gift, and the fact that it made it so difficult to pass amendments was also part of that gift, and the Electoral College was another wonderful thing our founders gave us, what, didn't it? And there are some people that are advocating an Article 5 convention to change the, uh, to change the uh, Electoral College. Um, states have conventions all the time without any problem, and they refer to a state constitutional conventions. And there's been, I don't know, I think I can figure out two, over 200. And when I first heard that, I didn't have the information to realize whether that's true or not. So I did a little research. And I discovered that uh, in 1972, a uh, state, I think it was, uh, not Nebraska, not Nevada, um, Montana. They had a convention, they wrote a new constitution. New York State, in the late 60s, had a convention, wrote a new constitution. Uh, in the 1840s, at a convention in Philadelphia, a Pennsylvania convention, the blacks lost the right to vote. And there's other examples of that. So, so and because it is apples and oranges, but to say that, yes, things have gone wrong at these conventions. Um, we have over 30 states with Republican majorities. It might be more now. So that should be, a, we can rest assured that that's fine. Well, I think there's a lot of Republicans that are elected in here that will tell you there's a lot of liberals, Republicans. We call them neocons, right? And they don't have the same perspective on the U.S. Constitution as most of us in this room. And they'll be delegates at this convention, I guarantee you. Alan Keyes was uh, here a couple of years ago, and Dan Ness asked him about it. He said, in a very, in a very dynamic guy, he said, how are you going to keep the Romney faction out or the Bush faction out? How are you going to do that? You can't do it. 
Um, the Supreme Court has reinterpreted the Constitution, so we need a batch of new amendments to set things right. Really? What about Article 3? Article 3 of the Constitution says that Congress can limit the Supreme Court's appellate jurisdiction. Why don't they do that? That's how you rein them in. Um, the con now, this is one that mostly people on the left, the Constitution is outdated and no longer valid for our times. It was written in, a, uh, in, a, in, a, by a, in an agrarian culture by dead, white, Euro, uh, Eurocentric males. That's what I hear. I believe the Constitution dealt with human nature more than anything else. And because of that, human nature never changes. I don't think the Constitution is obsolete at all. New amendments will force the federal government to obey the Constitution. That's like saying we have to have another amendment, we have to have the 28th Amendment to say you have to obey the Second Amendment. No, I don't think so. We have a people problem, not a paper problem. Back to the bottom line. Now this is what Wolfpack says. Congress has a 6% approval rating. Well, the founders gave us something else to remedy this. They gave us frequent elections. And their people say, oh, that's a waste of time. You shouldn't, we're not going to win it that way. Well, what if we all sat home and not got involved in the process? We would have 435 members of Congress that support Bernie Sanders and Hillary Clinton if we sat home. Yes, elections are very important, but what's more important are informed voters, and that's where our work comes in. We have to solve the problem. We have to do something. Who remembers Richard Nixon's wage and price controls back in the early 70s? Yes. And, and he said, uh, well, he, at least he was doing something. Yeah, but he made matters worse. That doesn't solve the problem. Only well-financed fringe groups oppose an Article 5 convention. Well, where are these groups? Because I could use some funds. My van has almost 180,000 miles on it. States will have control over the rules and pass laws restricting their delegates. The way with delegation, some states, I think a few states have passed it. Really? You're going to pass a law that will not, unless the convention is held in New Hampshire, will not be enforceable. And what if the, what if the delegates decide to have a, 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 a private vote, secret ballot? Then what? Agreements made at various conferences will be honored. Well, even Professor Nadelson, who's one of the legal minds behind the Article 5, said that the delegates can change the rules and make the rules. Now, here are just a few groups that support, um, supported Article 5 over the years. ALEC is the American Legislative Exchange Council. Uh, now, they've done some good things, but I know they support open borders. They support the, the, North Amer uh, the various trade issues. Friends of an Article 5, which don't get along with anybody, in, in, in both camps, Convention of States, Wolfpac, Move to Amend, that's the left-wing version, Cato Institute, Goldwater Institute, which, by the way, named after the late Barry Goldwater, who was against an Article 5 convention, the National Governors Association. They support an Article 5 convention. This is sort of hypocrisy to some extent. They want to rein in this power of the federal government, but guess what? They hold the patent to Common Core. What interesting. They hold the patent of Common Core, which is something that is being brought upon by the, from the federal government to the states. National term limits, single payer in Vermont, We the People of Maine, Alliance for Democracy, and some of the uh, folks who are known to be Article 4, 5 supporters, Alan West, and I like Alan West, I think he's a good man, Glenn Beck, Sean Hannity, Mike Farris, of the, uh, formerly of the Homeschool Legal Defense Association, and, and many others. Um, I want to read something to you by the founder of Convention of States, Mr. Mark Meckler. He makes the best case against an Article 5 convention. He says, I am an enthusiastic champion of living room conversations. Because over the years, the living room conversations, as you go to, go to their website, livingroomconversations.org, there's connections to Plan New Hampshire on that too. I think you should. But it was a very interesting comedy. I am an enthusiastic champion for living room conversations because over the last several years, I've come to realize that the largest divide in this country is not between citizens of one party or another, but between citizens and the ruling elite in Washington, D.C., and the state capitals. So there's a ruling elite at state capitals, which I agree to some extent. Will these people have any influence in their Article 5 convention? I would think they would have a lot of influence. Okay, now... I'm going to skip a little bit here. And 
Okay, now there's a lot of organizations on the other side of the issue. And by the way, being for or against something doesn't issue necessarily right or wrong. I'm just giving you an illustration that, not, that, that there's lots of people on the other side. The Oath Keepers group, the John Birch Society, which I've been affiliated with many years, Phyllis Flatley Eagles, Defend Not Amend, American Policy Center, led by Tom DeWeese, who's one of the best uh, chains of private property, Patriot Coalition, a number of Tea Party groups. Uh, I think the top legal scholar in the country, Edwin Vieira. Professor Lawrence Tribe, whom I'm not very uh, a fan of, he's a liberal. Professor Charlie Wright of Notre Dame, he was a, he was a dean of Notre Dame, a pretty conservative guy. The late John Ju Bork, and by the way, Mark Levin, who was one of the champions of Miracle 5, said in his opinion that Bork was the greatest legal mind of his time. I disagree with that. Um, Warren Berger, I don't like Warren Berger. The late uh, Justice Scalia, Alan Keyes. Uh, John and John Hancock. It's interesting. I just, I just discovered that a couple of years ago. Governor Hancock, the guy who signed the declaration, the first guy to sign it, was very much against an Article Five convention in uh, the, the very early days of our of our republic. You got guys like Larry Pratt, and I was a Republican. The Manchester Union leader and the Nature Tea Party Coalition has come out against this. The one of the groups sponsoring this event. Uh, the ACLU, which I do not like, but the Daughters of the American Rule of Beverly, which I do like. The NEA, which I do not like, uh, uh, the, uh, the VFW, which I like, and um, the VFW I don't think is actively opposing it, but they did sponsor resolutions some years ago, and many, many other groups and uh, individuals. And so, just a few questions, and I'll, then I'll a uh, few questions that I'm going to hope to answer here, and then we'll then I'm going to head on back to camp. The convention, who will be the delegates? Now, my wife had a serious medical procedure about 12 years ago, 10 years ago. And we knew a lot about the doctors involved, their backgrounds, their experiences. You're going to send people down to the convention where the Constitution is going to be sort of on the on the operating table. Who the will be? Janine Nada, will you be there as a delegate? Probably not. I would trust you. Who will be the delegate? I'm from Massachusetts. I guarantee you that I will not be a delegate from my state. People live in California. 54 electoral votes. You think they're going to send people like me to this convention? Um, will members of Congress be delegates? You see, there's a lot, like I say, there's no laws of, about it. And if state legislators can be members of the state conventions, why can't Congress?